A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa Aftulu Salatu Wa Tamu Taslim Ala Sayyidina Muhammadin Wa Ala Alihi Wa Sahbihi Ajma'een Wa Radiyallahu Ta'ala Ana Saadid Tabi'een Wa Ulama Al-Amaleen Wa Aimatu Al-Arabat Al-Mujtahideen Wa Muqalidihim Ila Yawmi Deen Amma Ba'd Assalamu Alaikum Wa Rahmatullahi Wa Barakatuhu Marhaban, welcome. You're tuning in, you're listening, or you're present at our weekly daughters, our weekly class, which we have titled the Rusul Aswad, the Black Lessons. All of these classes, lessons, or what have you, are somehow, some way, some fashion connected to or are about Islam and black people. Alhamdulillah, this is our fourth lesson. And as the title indicates, this lesson has to do with Al-Hajj Malik Shabazz, Malcolm X, Rahimahullah. May Allah have mercy upon him. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Khalil and Hind, alhamdulillah I appreciate your presence and thank you for joining And I also definitely appreciate the hordes and multitude of people that we have here present <laughs> Ameen Alhamdulillah I want to begin this evening's talk by mentioning two verses of the Quran. Allah says, Ala inna awliya Allahi la khawfun alayhim wa la hum yahzanun. Beware, verily the friends of Allah will not have any fear nor shall they grieve. This is Surah Yunus. Surah number 10, verse number 62. When Allah says, لا خوف عليهم ولا يحزنون No fear on them, nor shall they, shall, they, shall they grieve. This is referring to having worry or concern or fear for any sins that may have that the person may have committed in the past and having any uh, grief or anxiety about their station or the outcome they have in the next life. And so again, reading the English, Allah says the awliya, they don't have these fears and concerns. وَلَا تَقُولُوا لِمَنْ يُقْتَلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتٌ بَلْ أَحْيَاءٌ وَلَكِنْ لَا تَشْعُرُونَ And do not say about those who are slain, who are killed in the way of Allah, that they are dead. They are not dead. They are rather alive, but you cannot perceive their life. This is verse number 154 of Surah Baqarah. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Farooq Farooq So Allah says do not say that About those who are killed in the way of Allah That they are dead But rather they are alive And this is again something that Us Muslims living in the, this Akira Zaman This last days we have to make sure that we refine and as one brother was telling me after juma today tweak our understanding of islam to make sure that it is consistent with what allah has revealed and so those who are killed in the way of allah don't say that they're dead because they're not dead in other words the shuhada the martyrs they are not dead Allah says, Bel ahya'un. 
They are alive. This is Allah talking. But you just can't perceive them. Walakin la tash'urun. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam informed us that the martyrs, they are alive in the insides of green birds flying around Jannah, paradise. So they have their own chartered jet and they, they are flying around paradise. They, they are alive. And this is the, stat, the, state, the status or the station that our brother Ahaj Malik Shabazz Malcolm X enjoys. A lot of you from America may not realize this, but when you go around the Muslim world, even amongst racist people who claim to be Muslims, when they talk about or think about Malcolm X, they, they refer to him as the Shaheed of America. They refer to him as the martyr of America, the Islamic Shaheed martyr of America. And many of you who are American, who are Muslim, or even black or African-American Muslims, a lot of you don't know or don't realize this. But I hope that after today, that you, if you don't already understand or agree with this, that I would have changed your mind. Now, many times when someone refers to Malcolm X as Malcolm X, many Muslims will get upset and try to correct them. They will say that, you know, he became Muslim. His name is Ahaj Malik Shabazz. You should refer to him as that. And I understand the sentiments and it, I, I'm happy that a Muslim would care to defend the honor of Al Hajj Malik Shabazz. But I want you to ponder on what he said himself. He said he was interviewed after he came back from Hajj. And you can Google this. You can find this on YouTube. It's not a secret or anything. The one interviewing him said, I think a lot of people are confused about the new Arabic name, Al Hajj Malik Al Shabazz. And then Malcolm said, I've always had this name on my passport, Malik al-Shabazz. I only used it in the Muslim world. Hajj is a title that is given to any Muslim who makes the pilgrimage to Mecca during the official Hajj season. The questioner said, will you now use Shabazz and drop X? Malcolm said, I'll probably continue to use Malcolm X because, and I'll probably continue to use it as long as the situation that produced it exists. The interviewer said, you don't feel that Shabazz takes the place of X? And then Malcolm said, my going to Mecca and going into the Muslim world, into the African world, and being recognized and accepted as a Muslim and as a brother may solve the problem for me personally. But I personally feel that my personal problem is never solved as long as the problem is not solved for all of our people in this country. So I will remain Malcolm X as long as there is a need to protest, struggle, and fight against the injustices that our people are involved in in this country. So that is Malcolm X's answer to that question about preferring to use Shabazz in place of X. And it highlights some other points that we will mention later on, inshallah. And this indicates that Malcolm X Ahaj Malik Shabazz never cut himself off from his people, nor of their plight and their struggle. In fact, he didn't see a contradiction in struggling for the freedom of black people and Islam. And it's our intention to talk about that today, inshallah, because a lot of us do think there's a contradiction between being black and struggling for black people and our issues and being Muslim. Continuing, 
Malcolm X renewed the sunnah of jihad with the tongue. Most people know al Haj Malik Shabazz because of his speaking, his, his eloquent speaking. And he is a living manifestation of the following hadith. And Abi Sa'id al Qudri, qala qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, aftulul jihadi kalimatu adlin inda sultanin ja'irin au amirin ja'irin. It has been related on authority of Abu Sa'id al Qudri, who said that the Messenger of Allah, may Allah bless him and grant him peace, said, The best jihad or struggle is to speak the truth to an oppressor, ruler, or leader. And this hadith has been narrated by Abu Dawood, Tirmidhi, Imam Ahmed, and others. Malcolm X his speaking. A lot of us speak just because we have tongues. Malcolm X made sure his words counted. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Patience, alhamdulillah. He made sure his words counted. And he spoke the truth. And he spoke about justice. Another riwayah of this hadith says that Afdulul Jihad Kalimatul Haq. The best jihad is speaking the truth. This narration that we just read says Kalimatul Adlin. Speaking, uh, uh, speaking justice. A lot of us, we don't participate in this jihad. We're so busy trying to explain away the other jihad, the jihad of physically fighting that we don't even have enough Islam in us to speak the truth and speak justice to oppressive leaders and rulers inside or outside of the Muslim community. Malcolm X al Haj Malik Shabazz was the living manifestation of this hadith. He did not bite his tongue. And at the same time, he wasn't reckless with it. He made his words count. And what I, one of the things I find amazing, a lot of imams try to downplay and they try to throw shade on Malcolm. And they say things like, oh, he was a new Muslim, or he didn't really know that much, or he did this, or he didn't do that, or he did this, he did that, he did that. But that's really a manifestation of the ayats that we just mentioned in the beginning. Because remember the verse we mentioned that where Allah says, do not say of those who have been killed in the way of Allah that they are dead, but rather they are alive. You just don't perceive that, that they, are, they are alive. This is a, a, a subhanAllah. Just think about any righteous, popular imam when he's alive. How is he treated by his contemporaries or by his uh, colleagues? Like, for example, the Shehu, Sheikh Uthman Dan Fodio. When he came on the scene, a lot of the status quo imams, a lot of these imams or sheikhs during the time of the Shehu, if they were living in 2019 America, they would be called Coons or Uncle Toms. And a lot of them tried to throw shade on him because he was speaking the truth and he was offending the leadership. He was offending these corrupt Muslim governors and sultans and amirs. And they even tried to assassinate him. This is one characteristic that, that sticks to people of truth. Prophets and messengers had to deal with that. The ruling elite hating their message. They had to deal with other people of knowledge around them who you would expect would act according to the knowledge that they have instead using their knowledge to gain prestige and popularity and then using that knowledge and prestige in their station in this life to tear down those who are actually teaching the truth. I can even give you non-Muslim examples. Martin Luther King, if you look at his, uh, his reality in, 
in the Christian community, most of those old preachers were jealous of Martin Luther King because they, they really didn't want him preaching in their churches because he was going to take their shine. And when you look into his assassination, half of those preachers are implicated in his assassination. A lot of people don't know that Martin Luther King's family took the United States government to court and civil court and uh, for, took them to court, took the government to court, accused them of killing, uh, their, uh, killing Martin Luther King and they actually won the case and got a settlement. And their lawyer has written at least two books about it, talking about all of the evidences and things that they used. Green Berets was involved in his assassination. Martyr, I mean, not martyrs, mafia. The mafia was used in his assassination. Uh, other uh, Christian pastors in the Southern Christian Leadership Co Co Conference were involved in giving critical information about what color tie he was going to be wearing. And, you know, they changed his hotel room at the last minute so it can make it easy for the snipers. All of these things are documented. Why? Because Martin Luther King was speaking the truth. And so we're mentioning this because the, this is what people who speak the truth have to deal with when they are alive. Now, when they die, when they become martyrs, remember what Allah says, that they're not dead. So the same type of jealousy, animosity, and all of these things that came to them when they are alive, they still get it when they're dead because they're not really dead, as Allah says. They're still, they still are alive. So a lot of the same people who was hating on Malcolm when he was alive, even though he's been martyred, their, their uh, animosity, their jealousy, the shade that they throw on him is not decreased because he's not in our same physical realm. They still have a problem with them and that's why and I've tested this I've paid attention to certain imams and I make a mental note whenever I catch someone throwing shade on Malcolm I always make a mental note in my mind and then every time I hear him speak about Malcolm they always have to throw shade and I think it's even subconscious it will say you know yeah Malcolm did this Malcolm did that but you know, they always, it's always a but there. They can't just leave it alone. <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhaladheena amanu taqullaha wa kulu qawlan sadeeda yuslih lakum a'amalakum wa yaafir lakum dhunubakum wa man yuti Allah wa rasulahu faqad faza fawzan azeema This is surah 33. Al-Ahzab, verses number 70 and 71. Many of you hear this every Jumu'ah in your introduction, your Qutbah to Hajjah. It's the last verses that are mentioned. Allah says, O you who believe, fear Allah and speak a straightforward word. Kulu kawlan sadida. Yuslih lakum a'malakum. When we get into our Arabic grammar, yeah, some of my Arabic students here, when we get into our Arabic grammar, you're going to see by the way Allah constructed this sentence that these two types of sentences, they are called, what's called, shart, wajawabul shart. They're conditional sentences. And in conditional sentences, you have a condition and then you have the answer to the condition. So Allah is saying, or you believe, Speak a straightforward, fail Allah and speak a straightforward word. And then Allah says, Yuslih lakum a'malakum, meaning condition upon you doing that. If you have failed, if you're a believer, you fail Allah, you speak a straightforward word, Allah will rectify your actions. Allah, in other words, Allah will make your actions, your deeds, more consistent with His will. And, and He will forgive you your sins. And whoever obeys Allah and his messenger has already achieved a great achievement. That's, that's one thing that, you know, a lot of us don't recognize. See, there are, there are a lot of ways of drawing close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the ways of drawing close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always speaking the truth and speaking about justice. 
Just by just by being elite, being a believer, fearing Allah, and speaking that straightforward word, Allah will fix your actions, and Allah will forgive you your sins. And again, you see this in the life of our Hajj Malik Shabazz, Malcolm X. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Abdul Wahid, alhamdulillah. Malcolm X revived the sunnah of loving his people. Yes, we said sunnah of loving his people. He loved his people. That's one reason why he was and is so effective. You can't help someone if you do not love them or care about them. Malcolm X said in this same interview that we quoted earlier, there's one thing that I want to make clear. No matter how much respect, no matter how much recognition white showed towards me, as far as I'm concerned, as long as that same respect and recognition is not shown towards every one of our people in this country, it does not exist for me. Think about this statement right here. Think about this statement right here. I'm going to read it again. This is how you weed out Uncle Toms and Tokens and Coons. Because these people... They only care about themselves. They're not concerned with the rest of the people. They got treated good. They got treated all right. So oppression is over. It's cool. The struggle's over. Not for Malcolm. Malcolm said there is one thing that I want to make clear. No matter how much respect, no matter how much recognition white show towards me, as far as I am concerned, as long as that same respect and recognition is not shown towards every one of our people in this country, it does not exist for me. That's what he said. And I've seen videos of Malcolm X. And Malcolm X was hot on a college uh, speaking circuit that a lot of us take for granted. Right. And a lot of times he was speaking to all white audiences. And then, you know, me, I always just like now as a Muslim. When I see another Muslim speak, and usually someone academic, speaking in front of a non-Muslim audience, which a lot of times is usually white, I always, I always watch to see they're going to water something down, they're going to change it, they're going to do whatever. And most of them do. And I, one person comes to mind where I mentioned it before. Uh, I've seen him speak to a mostly white and academic audience. I think Allah has blessed this particular brother with a way that he speaks the truth and it's raw, but they seem to like it. It doesn't offend them. Me, Matt, if I said the same thing he said, they probably get offended. <laughs> but this one particular brother who I have in my mind, he don't water it down, but he, and he speaks the truth, and they're not offended by it. You know, alhamdulillah, not everybody's gifted like that. I'm not. Uh, Malcolm, I've seen him speak for example, I think he was speaking, it was somewhere in New England. Uh, nah, New England. Uh, it might have been uh, UMass at Elmhurst. One of them, one of them universities in, uh, in, in the Northeast. And he was speaking to a primarily white audience. It could even have been in Boston. But he was, he was talking about black people who want to integrate. And because, you know, the argument at that time was, you know, uh, Malcolm was like, you know, his famous statement was, we don't want to be integrated with the white man. We don't want to be segregated by the white man. We want to be separated from the white man. And it's the, a lot of people in 2019 don't even understand that. Think about what I said. We don't want to be integrated with him. We don't want to be segregated by him. We want to be separated from him. Three different things. And in 2019, people still haven't caught on to that yet. But uh, in any case, uh, he was talking to this predominantly white audience. And he said, the black people that's talking integration, they just want to have sex with y'all. <laughs> he said, they just, want, they just want interracial sex. That's all they want from y'all. And when I first heard that, yeah. <laughs> and when I first, when I seen that video, I said, I thought that he was saying it for shock value. Now, fast forward maybe twenty some odd years after I first heard that, and I see what's going on now. 
He was not lying. The, the, the inward motiv motivating factor for a lot of black people who will leave off their own freedom, justice, equality, their own best interests, and jump on board and support immigration reform and, and being for or against the wall and talk all day about that and not their own issues is because subconsciously they want to swirl. They want some exotic sex. They, would, yeah, they want these people to come from the south of the border. They want more Mexicans, more options. They want more, they want more Spaniards to have sex with. That's what that's, they won't admit it. A lot of them haven't thought consciously about it, but that's, that's the upside about it. They're not getting any tangible rewards for championing their cause while their children are still being shot dead in the street and, and, and people that are doing it not getting prosecuted for it. But you want to jump on everybody else's bandwagon, there's a subconscious reason for it. And I don't have too much time to get too much too deep into that, but he wasn't lying. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Martha and, and Rich, alhamdulillah, welcome. Yeah, I started late, about 10 minutes late, inshallah. Please forgive me. So, Malcolm, he cared about his people. And you're going to see later on, inshallah, that kind of like hurt his movement. And it's a lesson that we need to take in our communities now because all of this stuff is still relevant. I hope anyone that's listening don't think this is just a history lesson. Everything here is, a, is extremely relevant today. And in my opinion, it's, more, it's even more relevant than it was during Malcolm's lifetime. Many of us have been, have been tricked into this type of Islam, and it's not even really Islam, when, you know, when people quote <clears throat> verses of the Quran and, and Hadith to support this un-Islamic opinion, you know, when you actually dig into it, you really see that it's, it's nonsense. But a lot of people, a lot of us have this, uh, this colorblind Islam. Like, I even saw somebody put on a, a stat on Facebook, I think it was yesterday, said, I'm not a black nationalist, I'm not an American, I'm, a, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just Muslim. And subhanAllah, you know the, the deep thing about people that have this type of understanding? This person is actually arguing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why we have to be careful about slogans. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Rum, Wa min ayatihi kalku samawati wal ard wa akhtilafu al sinatikum wa al wanikum. The, from among Allah's signs is the creation of the heavens and the earth and the differences in our colors and our languages and the colors in our tongues. So this is from among Allah's signs. So this is sort of room surah number 30, a verse from Quran where Allah says that it's from his signs that he made variations in our colors. And you saying you don't have a color. I mean, what type of Islam is that? Well, I mean, can we start practicing Islam that's actually based on the Quran? I mean, this is people be saying things out of their mouth and they're not sure, and, and they don't even ponder. They think that they actually standing on the deen and upholding the deen and they actually selling the deen out and they jeopardizing their own station with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Abad ibn Kathirin Shami and Anim Aten Minhum Yaq. Yukalu laha fusailatu kalat samitu abi yakulu saaltu nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fakultu ya rasulullah amin al asabiyati and yuhibba rajulu kaumahu kala la walakin min al asabiyati and yu'ina rajulu kaumahu ala dhulmi. Ubadah ibn Kathir reported from a woman from among them called Fasila who said, I heard my father say, I asked the messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, O messenger of Allah, is it al asabiyya racism, nationalism, tribalism, that a man love his own people? He said no. But al asabiyya is that a man helps his people in oppression and wrongdoing. And this hadith has been related by Ibn Majah. So there's nothing wrong with loving your own people. Only someone that's fighting against his, his, his or her fitra 
uh, thinks is wrong with loving his own people. It's natural for you to love who you came from. It's natural for you to love yourself. It's natural for you to love your family. And it's, love, and it's natural for you to love your extended family, your people, your tribe. That's natural. Islam does not tell you to not love your people. And whoever tells you that, they are not teaching Islam. They are most likely teaching Arab nationalism or Indian nationalism or some other type of, or any kind of anti-black nationalism. They're not teaching Islam. And by the way, Arab nationalism, part and parcel, it was what got us into this particular, particular situation anyway. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Wailu lil Arab, woe to the Arabs. He was sleeping and he had a dream and he woke up. I believe he was with his wife Maymuna. And she and uh, she was like, What's wrong? He said, Wailu lil Arab, woe to the Arabs. Then a hole has been made in a barrier that that uh Lulu caught a name. Uh, today was Yamu Jumaah. Where we supposed to read Surah Al Kahf, Surah number 18. If you read Surah Kahf, Surah number 18, you, knew, you know who Dhul Qaranayn is. He built the wall protecting the people from Ya'juj wa Ma'juj. During the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a hole was made. A hole was made in that barrier. And what's the first thing he said about that? Wail al Arab. What does wail mean? Anybody know what that means? One of the names of the hellfire, uh-huh. And the other one is, um, uh, like, woe. Like, yeah, like, woe. Like, the, uh, warning. Like, mm -hmm. like, like, like a warning. In other words, they done did something wrong, right? Who's your juj and my juj? Anybody know? Is it pronouncer? Or? Yeah. During the last days of the time or whatever, they'll be let loose or they'll get through and cause ruckus. Yeah, I do, Jim, I do. Have these two, has, have these tribes of people been identified in our Islamic sources? You nodding, but I don't hear anything. <laughs> well, for, uh, um, for like a surety, I, I've heard them say it, it was different types of people, but mm -hmm. I, I haven't heard anything saying, yeah, that's, that's them. They are what was known as the Khazars, the Khazar tribe, who come from the area of southern Russia. If you look at the map and look at Russia, there's an area between the Black and the Caspian Sea. And these people are known as the Khazars. These people had collectively made a conscious decision to embrace Judaism. You following me? They made a decision to embrace Judaism. This is after Islam, after the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It was in a... Uh, 13th century in the 1200s. Is that with King Bulu or? I forget his name, but it was a particular king, yeah. And somebody wrote a book of, about their history. It's called The 13th Tribe by Arthur Cole something, right? But in any case, these Khazars embraced the Jewish religion as a, as a practical means of survival. Because they didn't want to come under Muslims and pay no jizya or nothing like that. And they didn't want to be forced into Christianity. And so in their minds, the, the, the middle safe, uh, the middle way or the safe choice or decision was to embrace the Jewish religion. So if the Muslims would win and take over their area, they would be protected by the Muslims because they would be considered Jews and just have to pay Jizya. Or if the Christians won, the Christians would leave them alone because they recognize them of a people of an earlier scripture, blah, 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 blah. 
I'm I'm oversimplifying and I'm summarizing, but you get the point. So you have a group of white people, Europeans, who became, who adopted the Jewish religion. Now, if you look, if you look in the Jewish community, you have two groups of people. And a lot of the DNA testing and all that, a lot of that early work comes from them because they have internal beef amongst themselves, arguing about who's a real Jew and who's not a real Jew. You have a group of, of Jews called Sephardic, Sephardic. And you have a group of Jews called Ashkenazi. The Sephardic Jews can literally trace their bloodline back to Isaac, the son of Abraham. They're really from Bani Israel. Then you got Ashkenazi Jews. They can't trace their lineage to, uh, through uh, Isaac, the son of Abraham. Their lineage goes back to these Khazars that we're talking about. So many of our Muslim scholars say that Gog and Magi, Ya'juj and Ma'juj, are from the descendants of the Khazars. Y'all following? So, when you, going back to the hadith, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Waylu lil Arab, woe to the Arabs. If you know anything about what happened in World War I, and I'm not going to go off into that too deep, but uh, the shaitan tricked the Arabs into fighting each other. And they tricked, because number one, you had the Ottoman Khilafat, Right? The Ottoman Empire, who was weak and it was being undermined, and they were really oppressive to a lot of different people, especially in the latter period. They were oppressive to the Arabs. The British and the other European powers came to uh, this man named Sharif Hussein, who claimed descended from the claimed to be descended from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and inspired him to lead an Arab revolt. And they revolted when the when World War One kicked off. The Ottomans started riding with the Germans. And there's a back history because the Germans was training them in military before even the war kicked off. So they had, a, they had an alliance with the Germans. And then the Arabs aligned themselves with the British, the French, and the Americans, and you know, the Allies. Long story short, the Allies won. Germans lost. And, but a lot of people, when you hear about World War I, you don't hear about this little war that's going on inside of World War I where you got Muslim Arabs fighting against Muslim Turks. And so, and that was really the agenda behind the war, to break the Khilafat. And it was the Arab treachery, which is in Arabic is called Quruj min uh, uh doing Quruj min al-Sulta, meaning uh, undermining your Islamic authority. And, and not only are they undermining Islamic authority, but they are mining, undermining Islamic authority on behalf of the Kufar. And so the ripple effect is what you see now. All of these Muslim countries that we know by name, Iraq, Iran, Syria, Jordan, none of these things, none of these places existed by those names and those, and those uh, boundaries during that time. These were new modern nation states that were created after World War I. And what they needed to help them do that was the Arabs being treacherous to their deen and holding up racism and Arab supremacy over Islam. And, and, and if you know this history, it's amazing that an Arab will call me or you nationalist or practicing an al asabiyya <laughs> because we only saying what Allah says as far as you know, acknowledging where you come from and loving your people. You undermine a whole Khilafat and, you know, <laughs> subhanAllah, you undermine a whole Khilafat. Millions of Muslims have been killed because of your actions, but we practice in al Sabia. The name of your country didn't exist before this. There was no such thing as Saudi Arabia before World War I. Like, uh, we don't really think about this. Well, what was it called before that? It was just called the Arabian Peninsula, Jazeera al Arab as it was called during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so the Arabs didn't even stop there after they fought the Turks and Sharif Hussein called himself the, the, the king of the Arabs. The British said, all right, get him, sick him, Ibn Saud, get him. 
So, so Saul, Ibn Saul fought him and took back the, most of Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula, and he named it Saudi Arabia. And I can go on and on and on about that, but that's not the purpose of our talk. Uh, I digress because I was talking about way little out of, and why did I go there? I was talking about loving your people, and I, I mentioned a hadith where he said, no, but al is that a man helps his people in oppression. Well, in any case, alhamdulillah, uh, moving right along. Many Muslims say Malcolm X was a black nationalist. And what they mean by that was that he was guilty of al asabiyah This is incorrect. And we talked about this. We dedicated a whole lesson, last week's black lesson, number three, about this topic. This is incorrect. If you listen to his famous speech delivered on April 12, 1964, called The Ballot or the Bullet, he clearly defines what he means by black nationalism at least two times. Black nationalism only means that black people must control the communities in which they live, the economy, the education, the politics, everything. I don't see how any Muslim could consider this un-Islamic. He was a practitioner of Al-Ihsan. He was a practitioner of Al-Ihsan. Or to Sawa, as we mentioned in the Juma Kutbah. These are synonyms. What do you mean? It was reported that Malcolm X used to fast every other day. He used to do the fast of Dawood. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Al-As, Fast one day and break your fast one day. This was a fast of Dawood, alayhi salam, and it is the best of fasts. Uh, Abdullah ibn Amr then said, I can do better than that. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, replied, there is no fast better than that. And this is in Sayyid Bukhari. So Al-Hajj Malik Shabazz, Malcolm X, used to practice this. He used to do the fast of Dawood. He used to fast every other day. That was his normal practice. And I heard... Sister Betty Bahia Shabazz, Rahimahullah, may Allah have mercy on her. Mm -hmm. I heard her when she was alive, she was on the radio program, and I heard her say that she never caught her husband looking at another woman. Like a lot of us get caught out there, right? Like, what you looking at, right? <laughs> right? Betty says she never caught her husband doing that. And this is amazing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kulil mu'minina ya guddu min absarihim. Tell the believing men to lower their gaze and to guard their private parts. That is purer for them. Truly Allah is aware of what they do. Shehu Uthman Danfodio says in his book, Umdatu Ulama, He may Allah bless him and grant him peace has established the guarding of the eyes from looking upon strange women by his words as related in Sahih Muslim Abu Dawood Tirmidhi on the authority of Jabir ibn Abdullah who said I asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about the unexpected gaze he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said avert your glance it was related by Abu Dawood and Tirmidhi on the authority of Barida who said that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said O Ali, do not follow the first glance with the second glance. Verily, the first one is for you, and the second glance is against you. So, alhamdulillah, I Haj Malik Shabazz. And I believe when Spike Lee did the movie Malcolm X, because a lot of people don't appreciate how much research goes into movies, even fictional and fake nonsense. There are aspects of these movies that people like, they go into depth researching. And when Spike Lee did the research for Malcolm X, he had a whole bunch of people around him. He was consulting a whole lot of people. And just reading this, I remember seeing the movie uh, X, Malcolm X, how when he was walking back to his whole hood and all them hookers and stuff was out, and they was like, hey baby, hey sugar, you wanna go out? He wasn't even looking, he was just kept walk, walking straight. Alhamdulillah. He was a true da'i. He was active in, in inviting people to Islam. 
His various speeches and public appearance and interviews attest to that to the fact that he took it, the responsibilities of propagating Islam very very seriously. He not only invited people to Islam, but he made it his business to correct the false teachings of the nation of Islam that he became famous for teaching. And this is something that a lot of us miss off. And I have what I'm reading from. It's from a, a lecture that I gave a while ago, and I had a, a picture that you can find this online. It's not no secret. It's a picture of his uh, Shahada certificate that they gave him at al Azhar. And I'll just read it. Uh, the Office of the Supreme Imam Sheikh Al Azhar, 10 uh, 9, 1964. In the name of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate, thanks to the Almighty who has sent his messenger with the guidance and the true religion in order that it may prevail over all other religions. Prayers and peace be upon our great Prophet Muhammad who guides to the truth and to the straight path. We have received in our office at Al Azhar Mr. Malcolm X, who is known, who is who is known now by the name Malik El Shabazz, an American citizen who declared his faith and conversion to Islam, and he confessed the two Islamic articles, saying, I confess that there is no God but Allah, and that Muhammad is his prophet, and Jesus is his servant and messenger. I cease to believe in any other religion that contradicts Islam. After seeing the certificate of the Islamic Foundation in New York, dated 9-4, uh, 1964, <coughs> And what the head of the great court of Islamic law at Jeddah decided if his, in, in, in this respect, Mr. Malik's de declaration of Islam has been assured to us. Mr. Malik of Shabazz, Malcolm X, with his true and correct faith, is one of the Muslim community with their rights and obligations. And it is his duty to propagate Islam and offer every available assistance and facilities to those who wish to convert who wish conversion to Islam. This is, a this is a certificate to whom it may concern. May God Almighty guide him and enlighten his heart by Islam and direct him to the right path. God's prayers and blessings be upon his prophet Muhammad, his family and his companions, director of Al-Azhar, Hassan, uh, Hassan Ma'mu. Uh, Ma 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 so, alhamdulillah, this is... Uh, a certificate that they gave him. He had already taken Shahada, but they just affirming and certifying his Shahada and basically uh, informing anyone who wants to know that he has their, their stamp of approval in inviting people to Islam and, you know, calling people to the, to the proper guidance, to the proper way of life. Uh, on one occasion, Malcolm said, and this is something that a lot of us need to learn from, because a lot of us, we still haven't gotten this right yet. He said, don't think that I don't know how bad I make myself look by attacking an organization I was once, once so inseparably a part of. But I'm not concerned with how bad it makes me look. My prime concern is to expose it to the fullest of my ability. Let the chips fall where they may. He said this in 1964, talking about the Nation of Islam. And so... Uh, a lot of us, we haven't, you know, a lot of people talk trash about Malcolm X because they don't, they don't have the heart to do what he did. And he, and he was saying this while, while the nation of Islam was strong. And we know they were strong because they ended up killing them, right? He said it when, he, when, when they was physically strong. A lot of us come from the nation of Islam. We know that there was falsehood. We know that they, was, we know that they say that Allah appeared in the person of Master Farah Muhammad. We know that they say Elijah Muhammad is a messenger of Allah. We know that they say that uh, the paradise and hellfire is just, is just allegorical. All of these, having any one of these three beliefs I just mentioned take you outside of Islam. Many of us came from that and now we claim to be Sunni Muslims or whatever, but we still won't admit that that belief is wrong. We would get all vague and, you know, well, they did do a lot of good good around us, whatever. We're not talking about good. We're talking about belief. Well, so I, who, is a, who am I to judge? You know, I came for that. that coming from that, that's what led me to Islam. Oh, oh shirk led you to Iman, right? That, that's that good. That one plus one does equal three. Okay. Shirk, associating partners with Allah, led you to believing that there's only one God. Oh, okay, I understand that. Alhamdulillah. This should not, how can I say? And a lot of people, their the logic is flawed. 
Shirk is the greatest sin. No Muslim will argue that, right? Fornication is another type of sin, a big sin, right? Many men and women have came to Islam because they had a boyfriend or a girlfriend. And that boyfriend or a girlfriend was a Muslim. I would be laughing. But that, that's how a lot of people found out about Islam. Many sisters had boyfriends, and their boyfriends were Muslim. They were sleeping together, and, and they found out about Islam. Maybe they saw him making wudu, or always jumping in the shower, making a strange gusel, right? What, what you doing? Well, I said, well, I'm not supposed to be with you. I'm, you know, this is all I am. I'm washing up. I got to pray, right? Or something, right? And so this inspired many sisters to learn about Islam. Now, these same sisters... They don't go around saying, you know, alhamdulillah for zina, fornication and adultery. And I will never speak bad against fornication and adultery because if it wasn't for fornication and adultery, that's what brought me into Islam. Nobody would say that, right? It sounds stupid. But we don't apply that same, that same logic to, uh, to shirk, which is even more of a crime than fornication and adultery. We say Alhamdulillah for the nation of Islam and all the stuff that they believe because if it wasn't for the nation of Islam, because it wasn't for the nation of Islam, what have you, I wouldn't have embraced Islam. No, Allah guided you to Islam despite the fornication and adultery. He guided you to Islam despite the kufr and the shirk that you were involved in, not because of it. And this is something that a lot of us, us don't, we don't understand it. Malcolm understood it. And that's why a lot of us ain't Malcolm. <laughs> he understood it. He didn't let his political and social work stop him from seeking knowledge of the deen. Malcolm had Sheikh Ahmed Hassoun, a Sudanese Sheikh, living with him for several months before he was martyred. This was his personal spiritual advisor. And I have a picture of it here. I know a front facing camera is inverted, but none of these pictures are secret. You know, you can Google them. They're, they're online. SubhanAllah. Back in the day, I attended a lecture. And one of my teachers, Sheikh Imran Hussein, was one of the people uh, lecturing. This is in New York. And something historic happened at that lecture. And I couldn't remember what, what, what date it was or anything like that. And then Sheikh Imran Hussein, recently, like a couple of years ago, he mentioned it. And then he mentioned the date of the lecture. I was like, Allahu Akbar. Because uh, one of my ex-wife, one of the mothers of my children, she had a son. And he probably, he might be watching this, right? Uh, Fahim. And he was a baby at the time. And we come into this lecture and Fahim is screaming, ah, 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 right? And so, like, I'm taking turns uh, with him. My wife then at the time was taking turns with him. And we had to keep leaving the hall because, you know, baby screaming and crying. So we sit in there, sitting close to the back so we can keep going, taking turns going in and out the door. And... Betty Shabazz had just finished speaking. And she said, you know, I'm getting kind of emotional now. Every time I, I don't mind talking about him, but at a certain point I get really emotional, whatever. So I'm going to just end it. And if any, and they, were, and they had copies of his autobiography there. And uh, she said, I'll be in the back to sign copies of any, if his autobiography if anybody wants, anybody wants any, right? So I'm sitting like in the second to the last row. And Betty Shabazz is sitting right behind me. Fahim started crying, ah, screaming. She says, you want me to hold him? He's like, yeah. So my ex-wife passed, passed by him to her. And so she's, uh, so as soon as Betty Shabazz started holding him, he got quiet. So that's that grandma effect, right? Now, mind you, Betty Shabazz, she was older at this time. She's on a cane, right? And she said she wasn't going to be speaking anymore. Then I remember going to the uh, bathroom. And we was a long line waiting because it, it was time for Salat. So everybody's in line waiting to go to uh, the, use the bathroom and, and to make wudu. And so me and Sheikh Imran Hussein is in the line together. And, and we, 
we got closer after that, but we were just really meeting each other at this time. And so he was like, what's his name? I was like, his name is Fahim. And then Sheikh Imran Hussein said, oh Allah, make him like Sheikh Al-Fahim Job. Mm -hmm. And if anybody who's been around a long time, there was a beautiful West African Sheikh named Sheikh Al-Fahim Job, who used to be teaching in New York back at the time. And he had died. And I, you always hear me when a lot of times I talk about death and I talk about a Sheikh who was in a car accident mm -hmm. and a car hit them from, he was on the way to the airport. A car hit his car from behind and it was a light accident. It was type of them, one of them type of accidents where you get out, there's no dent, uh, no problem, go about your business, right? But he was sitting, the Sheikh was sitting in the back seat and his head just hit the headrest from the, in the, from the seat in front of him and he died. No dent on a car, no nothing, but he just died like that. Big Janazza. I mean, you couldn't even get to the masjid. It was big. But it, anyway, this is a big West African sheikh who was in, teaching in New York at the time. And so he made that dua, the Fahim. So Fahim, if you're watching, you know, remember that sheikh made dua for you at the time. Live up to your name, brother. Still got time. Yeah, you still got time. Not saying that he's doing bad, but <laughs> I'm just t t giving you a little bit about your history. This took place on September 22nd, 1996. In New York and the title was something like Malcolm X and leadership for the 21st century right now in this lecture another one of the speakers was Amir Islam and a lot of you familiar with him uh, uh, good brother uh, in, in this in this lecture he was going on and on and on and on and on about how Imam Waterford D. Muhammad rahimahullah, was the teacher and spiritual advisor for Malcolm X Right? He was, and he kept saying it on and on and on and on, right? He kept reiterating and, and driving that point home. And remember, I'm sitting right in front of Betty Shabazz, and I hear him ask another, I hear her ask another sister, what'd he say? And then she like stopped whatever conversation she was in and was listening, right? Now, I didn't know this at, this time, at the time, but she knew I'm in Islam. They both were working together at Mega Evers College in Brooklyn. But in any case, uh, said, what'd he say? And then she, and then she, he reiterated again, and then she said, well, "Oh, I, I, I need, I need to say something. Excuse me. Ain't nobody gonna tell Betty, no, right? So she made her way back to the stage, cane and everything, right? And got back up on the stage, and she said, I just need to uh, correct something that my brother was saying. Uh, uh, she said, my husband, she, he did seek counsel and advice from." Imam Walter D. Muhammad. That's true. But his advice that he would seek from Wallace was usually restricted to affairs dealing with his father, meaning Elijah Muhammad. Uh, my husband had other people who he would go to regarding knowledge of Islam. And then she said, I just wanted to correct that. And she got right back off the stage. And I said, hmm. <laughs> I was like, that was one of them aha moments. Hmm. And in 2019, this took place in 1996, right? In 2019, you got people who, you know, because of their extreme uh, uh, organizational loyalty and affiliation, they'll go around and try to tweak history and try to know his teacher was, and they put that picture of Malcolm leaning over and, and, and Imam Walk D. Muhammad whispering in his ear. I think the picture has Elijah Muhammad speaking. And, and see, that's who he used to learn his thing from Walk D. Muhammad. Knock it off. Stop playing. Right, and so, and so I, I found that it was a, uh, something beautiful. But in anyway, uh, a lot of this is a lesson for a lot of us because a lot of us we feel that we got to make a choice. Do I want to be involved in social work or do I want to learn my dean? As if they contradict each other. As if you can't do both, right? And but usually, most of us we either are involved with learning and teaching the dean and no social work, or we either involved in social work and no learning or teaching of the dean. We're extreme. Malcolm wasn't like that. He was the embodiment of this well-known hadith. And Anas ibn Malik, qala qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, talibul ilma fariditun ala kulli muslim. Seeking knowledge is obligatory upon every muslim, as it was narrated by Anas ibn Malik, Malik on authority of, uh, as it was related by Ibn Majah. So a lot of people talk about 
you know, oh, Malcolm didn't really know anything. He had a sheikh living at, your, living at his house. When's the last time you had a sheikh living at your house? A lot of us, we want to keep the sheikh real far away from my house. We want to, you know, we want to be their groupies. We want to go everywhere. Whenever there's a spring break or I got off from work, I'll be the sheikh's groupie. I'll wash his feet and kiss his hand and, you know, and carry his picture with me all the time. But I ain't bringing the sheikh in my house with me. You know, he can stay right where he at, right? Malcolm was serious about his Islamic knowledge. Malcolm X is still being rewarded for things that he did when he was still alive. And Abi Huraira ta ana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qal idha mata al-insanu in qata'a in qata'a anhu a'maluhu illa min thalathatin illa min sadaqatin jariyatin aw ilmin yutafa'u bihi aw waridin salihin yad'u lahu It has been related it has been narrated on authority of Abu Huraira who said that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said when a person dies all of his deeds come to an end except three a sadaqa jariya, a sadaqa jariya, an ongoing charity, a waqaf, or an endowment. Beneficial knowledge, or a righteous child who makes dua for them. And this hadith has been related by a Muslim and uh, Abi Dawood and many others. Indeed, and I'm quoting a book. Indeed, one of the fruits of the religious side of Malcolm's overseas sojourning was the endowment of expense-free scholarships to Islamic institutions made available to the Muslim mosque. During Malcolm's second tour, he received 20 scholarships from the Cairo-based Supreme Council on Islamic Affairs, SCIA, which were designated for young Afro-Americans to study at Al-Azhar. He likewise received 15 scholarships for applicants wishing to study at the University of Medina, Saudi Arabia. Dun, 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 dun. The scholarships which both Muslim Mosque and the, OOA, and the OAAU advertised were not only significant for economic reasons, but also as an insurance against future distortions of Islam among African Americans. This quote is from Louis A. DiCardo's book, On the Side of My People, A Religious Life of Malcolm X, pages 233 to 234. And if you, you, were, you all were paying attention to the intonations in my voice when I mentioned some of these institutions, and I didn't mention that the Sheikh Hassoun that he had living with his house, he was a representative of the Muslim World League, Rabbi Talib al Islamia, right? Which was a Wahhabi institution. This is back when the Wahhabis were calling themselves Wahhabis, before they started, started calling themselves Salafis. Again, he had 15 scholarships for applicants wishing to study at the University of Medina. Dun, 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 dun. Allah does what he wills, subhanAllah, dot, dot, dot. I'll just leave that there. One person that we know of that benefited from these scholarships was who? No, these scholarships that Malcolm got. Sheikh Tawfiq, Rahimahullah. Anybody who know who Sheikh Tawfiq is? MIB? Huh? MIB? He founded the uh, uh, Mosque of Islamic Brotherhood, where Imam Talib Abdul Rashid is the Imam at right now. Harlow. Man, you should know, brother. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Sheikh Tawfiq went and studied Al Al Azhar on the scholarship that Malcolm got. One of these scholarships you're talking about here? <clears throat> was granted to Sheikh Tawfiq. And it wasn't just like, okay, you cool with Malcolm, go. Uh, Imam Talib said that he still had to take an entrance, entrance exam and all that stuff to get there. So, and he came back, and uh, if my understanding is correct, the Muslim Mosque Incorporated was going through some type of flux and all kind of crazy craziness. So 
he ended up starting the Mosque of Islamic Brotherhood. So the MIB is literally a product of, you know, the scholarships that Al Haj Malik Shabazz secured, Malcolm X secured. I mean, just think about the hadith that we mentioned. Everyone that makes salat in MIB, everyone who took shahada, anyone who learned any deen, anyone who gets any benefit from MIB, just look at all the benefit in that chain, all going back to Al Haj Malik Shabazz, Malcolm X. Because when you, the hadith says, when you die, all your actions are cut off except for three. He passed on beneficial knowledge. He passed on Sada Kajaria. This is considered Sada Kajaria. Uh, Allah used him to facilitate uh, uh, free scholarships for brothers to go and learn Al Islam. Malcolm didn't abandon his people. Oh, I went to a lecture, and this is one of the lectures that I regret not taking good notes. It was at the Schomburg. Uh, What's the technical name for that place? Schoenberg Center for Research in Black Culture. It's a branch of the New York City Library, right? But that, that particular branch is named after Arthur Schoenberg, right? It's like a museum. They have a lot of relics of a lot of important people, especially Malcolm X. A lot of times they find or discover or people sell or turn over anything that has historical value relating to Malcolm X. A lot of times it ends up there. And a lot of times they used to have, and they probably still do have a lot of lectures there connected to Malcolm X. I went to one of those lectures. And this when a lot of people were still alive that was connected with Malcolm, like Percy Sutton. Anybody know what Percy Sutton is? He was a lawyer. You remember David Dinkins? He was the first black mayor of New York. Percy and all of them was cool. They ran all in the same circles. He was representing Malcolm's family and all that when he was alive. Uh, Percy Sutton was there. Uh, a whole lot of people was there that was actually around Malcolm, like real close. And the lecture was going good. And it just goes back to the ayat that we mentioned in the beginning about the martyrs being alive. Because you got all these people in the same room. And then it, I, I felt so, I felt like somebody said, nigga, get your hand out of my pocket. They started arguing and fighting. No, I heard you in the back room arguing with Malcolm. You trying to come here front like you was right with him. You was against him. I was against him. You was against him. You were supposed to protect him. And the election at the end, it was over. They even start fighting. And and if you are if you watch any Malcolm documentaries. And Percy Sutton's in him. Watch when he says, I know things about, you know, Malcolm and his assassination that I'm aware of. And I've never told anyone. And I never will tell anyone. Like, you can, he's speaking about these things decades after it happened. You still see the fear in his face. One of the things that people think he knew was the names of the actual assassin. Because if you remember, you know, Malcolm had a, a, a nice uh, intelligence apparatus that a lot of people don't respect. Because just like any organization, right, you have people that were still with the nation, but, you know, everybody, people see things black and white, but the reality is not black and white. You have people that was with the nation, they knew all the work Malcolm put in, and they still had love for him. But for whatever reason, they stayed with the nation or they didn't want to make their love and affinity for Malcolm known, but they was feeding Malcolm info and vice versa, right? So Malcolm knew the names of the people who was given the contract to kill him that day. And he had those names in his pocket on a piece of paper. Betty got that piece of paper. And many people believe that Percy Sutton became aware of these names. And, and so he's like, I, I don't know. I, I know stuff I, I never told and I never will. And I don't, I don't think he ever did either. I think he died. Somebody look him up. Percy Sutton. I think he's dead. He died 2009.
Malcolm had a deep love and concern for his people. And you know, when you are a major figure like that, you got to understand Malcolm was treated like the representative of black people in, in America. Whenever he traveled, he was meeting with heads of states, ambassadors, and he, he was treated like the president of black America. And like, and if you haven't traveled overseas or moved around like that, you don't understand what that means. Like you don't, cause you, cause reality, we are a nation within a nation. We just don't realize it yet. We are a nation within a nation. And Malcolm was seen as the unofficial head or representative of that nation. And so he was treated like a head of state when he traveled. And when you making moves like that, and you know, he just knew becoming Muslim and all that kind of stuff, a lot of people made him promises. Basically, you know, when I go back to America, I'm going to continue teaching Islam. I'm going to uh, try to correct all the false teaching I've been teaching for all these years. And we're going to build up Islamic institutions. Right? And so a lot of Muslims promised Malcolm financial monetary support. A lot of people that he was talking to had these Wahhabi leanings. That's why I was you know, being dramatic with mentioning the University of Medina and mentioning these things. You know, with these understandings, right, they are the ones who promote it amongst us that I ain't black, I ain't nothing, I'm just Muslim type of understanding in Islam. So now you hear this, now you hear this Muslim who embraced Islam and is going to teach Islam but what they want them to do is leave off that black talk. Just promote our, our brand of Islam. <clears throat> and Malcolm was not going to do that. And many people have reported, reported that Malcolm would even get into uh, arguments with Sheikh Hassoun on that issue. Like, you know, why don't you just teach Islam? You know, we forget the black stuff. And Malcolm wasn't about to do that. So... I'm about to read to you a letter from Malcolm to the Islamic Center in Gene uh, Geneva, Switzerland, and it's going to it's going to highlight some uh, uh, some information. Uh, this is January 11th, 1965. This is a little more than a month before he was assassinated. Doctor Saeed Ramadan, my dear brother, Assalamu alaikum. May these lines find you, your family, and the believers there in the best of health and enjoying wealth and happiness according to the will of Allah. Remember, this is Malcolm writing a letter. And this, I got this letter from the same book that I quoted earlier on the side of my people, a religious side of Malcolm X. I was very pleased to receive both of your phone calls and honored and honored at the invitation to speak there in Geneva. It is always a blessing to be able to tell the world what Allah and Islam has done for me and our people here who have accepted it in America. Since my return to the States, I have been very busy trying to get the Muslims reorganized into the true Islam. And as the enclosed clippings show, I have been met I have been meeting great opposition from Elijah from the Elijah Muhammad faction. For he fears that if Afro-Americans hear true Islam, his own followers will then be able to compare it with what he is teaching, and that they will then leave him. So he is willing to see murder committed to keep true Islam from getting properly organized. And most of his wrath is directed at me because he knows I'm one of the very few people who understands the basic psychology of our own people here well enough to organize them. So I'm kept busy trying to get our people together while at the same time I'm kept quite busy just trying to stay alive. 
Also, upon leaving the black Muslim movement, we left all of our treasures behind in that movement. Thus, we are very poor, and everything we do, we must do with almost nothing. And this makes it doubly hard. But still, Allah is blessing us with success. This is why I said I will come to speak in Geneva, but would not be able to pay my own way this time. In fact, at the present time, I don't know, I don't see how I am going to be able to make Hajj this year. All the finance we can scrap up is needed for our re reorganization work here. When I was in Saudi Arabia, His Excellency Said Umar al Saqaf, Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs, promised their government will help us rent a suitable place here. But I've heard no more from him. Do you know him? If we had stronger support from the Muslim world, it would be very easy for us to spread true Islam here in this country. I must dash off to a meeting right now, but we'll look forward to hearing from you real soon. May Allah bless all of you. The believers here join me in greeting you. Assalamu alaikum. Malik al Shabazz. SubhanAllah. So you see, part, part of the backstory that's, that's obviously not mentioned in this letter is that Malcolm was promised financial and organizational support from the Muslim world, but they reneged because he wouldn't start, stop talking his social justice talk, which is Islam. So they didn't support him. And this is the reality with a lot of our communities right now. We don't get support. And you can see, subhanAllah, how Malcolm was sending clippings and the progress of their dawah. A lot of, a lot of uh, Muslims nowadays don't realize that when uh, the same Wahhabi movement, now rebranded itself Salafi movement, got established in the West, they used to have to send reports back to their paymasters as well. Yes, I'm serious. Depending on what shake they was connected with or which organization, never directly to the government, just whatever organization they would come through. That's why back in the mid-90s and the late 90s and the early 2000s, almost all of the, the big uh, Salafi imams here, they would make hajj every year. They was paying for that themselves. They was getting sponsored. They would have to send back sometimes quarterly, quarterly reports. I heard it from one of their imams myself. I'm not going to mention his name, but he even mentioned it publicly, but I still won't mention his name. But anyway, how he said that he would have to send back reports and, and these reports will be detailed. Like for example, they would say, you know, well, what is the most competition that you, I forgot, obviously I haven't seen these reports myself, but they will want to know who is giving them the most competition for the hearts of the Muslims. Like, who's not on the Salafi Dawah that's presenting a, 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 a competition or a problem for us? And, for example, if it was Sheikh such and such, and maybe this person, he's good at uh, Islamic or African history, then they'll do a program similar to it at the same time. This, is, this, is their, this has been their history ever since Saudi Arabia came into existence, for real, for real. They do a, 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 a status check of any opposition to their DAWA. And then once they identify it, they'll run a counter DAWA program at the same time with, with a similar theme, get the people divided and to divert people away from the other DAWA. They did it in, when Saudi Arabia first came into existence as a country. When Saudi Arabia <coughs> came into existence, that right before that was the fall of the Khilafah. There was no Khalifa. And so a group of notable people, scholars and world leaders, got together and organized a, con a convention or a conference in Egypt to uh, reestablish the Khalifa, Khilafah. When they found out about this, the Saudis organized a similar conference at a different time. And most, at that time, most people were traveling over land or through, sh through uh, a ship. Not a lot of people were traveling on airplane. So if you were a scholar or somebody of note in the Muslim world, you couldn't ch go to both conferences. You had to choose one to go to. And it kind of it took away the legitimacy 
of the Egyptian conference because if we talk about establishing a khilafa, a khalifa, or reestablishing it, and he don't even have the power to call out when Hajj is going to be and when Hajj is not going to be because he's not controlling Mecca, then how powerful is he? And so that kind of like watered that down, what happened. And so you can see how early in the Saudi uh, in Saudi Arabia's uh, establishment, how they look at <clears throat> the rest of the Muslims who don't ascribe to their uh, methodology and they try to divide and, you know, it's kind of like, uh, for example, like in the United States. It's kind of like in the United States. A lot of times you can, te you can tell who's really behind certain movements by their methodology. In other words, you can tell a fruit, you can tell what type of tree it is by the fruit it bears. I'll give you an example. In the West Coast, in the 70s, the Black Panthers emerged out of Oakland, right? Now... Everybody knows, well, everybody should know about the Black Panther. And no, we're not talking about the movie. <laughs> Superhero. No. If you thought we were talking about the movie when I mentioned Black Panther, you're a proof of why they made the movie Black Panther. Right? Uh, the Black Panthers, the uh, black organization that was dedicated to social justice that really uh, came out, uh, was birthed out of, you know, pre preventing police brutality. Another group came up, boom, United Slaves, U.S. You ever heard that? Yeah. Uh, you, they call themselves United Slaves. And they was doing the same thing, but they had like a African slant to it. Like, like nowadays you would call them ho-teppers. Like, you know, like nowadays the woke community. Like... You know, people that talk about Africa all day, ain't never been to Africa, don't know nothing about Africa, probably can't name five countries in Africa, but they all Africa, right? So they was like that. And I think a good movie that I've seen that kind of like depicted that was the movie Panther. You remember that movie? Mm -hmm. Who played in that? Joaquin Woodburn. It was... It's none because they made a, a movie about the Black Panthers a couple of years ago. I'm not talking about that. Definitely not talking about the Marvel comic, whatever. Talking about the movie Panther that came out at least 10, 15 years ago. You could probably find it on YouTube. But they depicted that. And you know, you had the leader up there, you know, with his dark shades on and you know, you know, more libations. <laughs> had women who were like serving them or whatever. And then they were supposed to protect Betty Shabazz and the, and the Black Panthers. Yeah, Kadeem Hardison is smile, yeah. The Black Panthers, uh, they, rec they recognized that these United slaves that had a, supposed to be doing the same type of work, they was protecting Betty Shabazz, but they had guns that didn't have no ammunition in it. So how you go, how you go do anything with it? You got no bullets in your gun, right? So he exposed that, whatever, they depicted that. But that's what they depicted. I don't know if they mentioned it by name, but that's what they were depicting. That kind of stuff really happened. And so, uh, you had two organizations, two groups, doing the same type of work, and they was fighting each other. And the United Slaves, they killed a lot of Black Panthers. <clears throat> they killed Bunchy Carter at, uh, and he brought a lot of people because he was a big gang leader in LA and he brought a lot of them over to the Black Panthers he was like one of the people from the street that gave a lot of street cred to the Black Panthers and and they killed him and a lot of other notable people but you know the funny thing about it you know who the head of the United Slaves was his name was Ron Everett you know what he changed his name to Malana Karinga that name sound familiar? He created Kwanzaa. Mm -hmm. And he did a hodgepodge of this Islamic terminology, uh, key Swahili language, all these things, and made a holiday. And this holiday was supposed to be, because oh, you know, the Jews have Hanukkah, the Christians have Christmas, us black people need some. So I'm going to make this thing up, Kwanzaa. 
right? And so, and you know the funny thing about it is, a lot of, it's, it's amazing. We live during the time of the Me Too movement, right? Where people, we're supposed to be concerned about black people, black, we're supposed to be concerned about women who have been uh, abused and molested or raped or, or disrespected, right? But this person did time and was raping and abusing all the black women that was down with him. And he, and he did time for it. We follow his holiday, right? Which went to other black people, don't listen to R. Kelly, right? Because you're doing the same thing Rob, Rob, Maulana Karinga was doing. Why, why are you not going to listen to R. Kelly, but you're going to still celebrate Kwanzaa, right? You see how people, their logic is never consistent. Okay, mute R. Kelly. You're going to mute R. Kelly, and I'm not advocating listening to music anyway. I, was, I muted R. Kelly a long time ago, right? <laughs> now, seriously, I'm not just saying that because it's fashionable to say it, right? I remember R. Kelly been on mute, right? But you say, okay, we can't listen to R. Kelly because he did all of these things with, to, uh, to black women. Okay, fine, that logic. Okay, mute Kwanzaa. He did these things against black women. Why you don't mute Kwanzaa? See, the, the logic is never consistent. And that's a proof that you're just following your nuts. Most of the time, if you are cool with muting R. Kelly, you probably muted him anyway. You don't, you don't care nothing about the R. Kelly, right? And I seen pictures of a concert R. Kelly just did in Chicago. Who's there? A whole bunch of black women. It ain't no black dudes like, no, nah, R. Kelly, we ride with you, man. It was cool for you to piss in that little girl's mouth and to hold these girls hostage, man. We still love you. No, it's the women that's doing it. But then they, they twist the narrative to make it seem like all these men are supporting him. No, it's the women that's supporting him. Including some of these same women that was behind the documentary that just reminded everyone of what they already know. Some of these same people who organized the documentary, who spoke in the documentary, they was big up, big, you know, they was promoting R. Kelly on their platforms at Ebony, Root, Essence, and all of these institutions that they worked at well after uh, the Aaliyah situation when he married her when he was 15, well after when he pissed in that girl's mouth and it was on a videotape, they was promoting it way after that. Now they want to turn around and flip like they're all of a sudden outraged. No, these same individuals supported him after knowing all of that. So they're in it for the bag and popularity. They're not sincere. But the logic, hey, mute R. Kelly. Okay, well, mute Kwanzaa too. He abused women, me too, right? And why y'all pretending like there's not no men or no boys that's been sexually molested and abused? Right? You forget about them. That's been molested and abused by men and women. Why nobody talking about them? But that's all. I'm getting off to a whole other topic. We back talking about Al-Haj Malik Shabazz, Malcolm X. And why don't y'all mute Elijah Muhammad? Uh-oh. <laughs> I mean, I mean, hey. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I'm like, well, I don't, me too, right? All them secretaries. That Farrakhan got them all, the ones who still like got them all, and say, hey, these were the wives of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And, you know, so they, they re, re, uh, rewriting history, re revisionist history. If they, was, if they were his wives, why were they suspended and outcast from the Nation of Islam when they got pregnant and all kind of stuff? Right? But people ain't no paying attention to that anyway. So people selectively, you know, talk about me too and mute this and mute that. You gotta be careful what bandwagon you jump on. So Alhamdulillah, Ahaj Malik Shabazz, he, Malcolm X, he, one of the lessons that we need to learn uh, regarding this last point is that we have to be self sufficient. And we have to support our own endeavors because as long as we stay true to the true message of Islam, which includes social justice and doing right by our people, by number one, praying and working that they be guided to the religion of Allah, but even outside of that, protecting them. Uh, all this government shutdown, if it's going on, there's a whole lot of services that's going to be cut down. 
We need to be doing, putting stuff in place to not, to not only help us that go to this masjid, but also anyone else who we can help. We need to start talking about that. We need to start talking fast, right? And so we need to start helping our people in, in all aspects of life, whether that's feeding them or put, providing clothes for them. A lot of us have clothes we don't wear. We have food we don't eat. We need to give it to people. Before that stuff go bad, there's people that I would love to have it. So, alhamdulillah, these are some works, some of the things that Ahaj Malik Shabazz didn't leave off. Malcolm X, he didn't leave off. He didn't, just because he became Muslim, that didn't mean his understanding of Islam was that that didn't cut him off from his people. Malcolm X, Alhaj Malik Shabazz, is the under, underrated and forgotten Muslim. And our intention for de uh, de dedicating today's black lesson to him was to remind us about him and, and and to encourage all of you that you need to study his life deep he was a he was a complex and deep brother our martyr our shaheed malik al shabazz don't just stop with the documentary you need to create a timeline about his life he's subhanallah i mean don't stop with this autobiography that's what i meant to say use that as your starting point but you even keep in mind that as you're reading the autobiography, there are at least two chapters missing from the autobiography. And I forgot where they're at, at now, but people were just recently talking about it a few months ago. They re-emerged someplace. So understand, even though the autobiography of Malcolm X is a good book, uh, uh, it's written well, and Al-Hajj Malik Shabazz, he did collaborate in the effort but for real, for real, it's really not an autobiography, even though it's called the autobiography of Malcolm X, because he didn't see the finished product. He don't know that two chapters was left out. He didn't know that, or maybe he didn't know, Alon knows best, but he didn't know that Alex Haley was working with the FBI when he was, uh, when he was interviewing Malcolm X for the autobiography. He was, Malcolm would write on tissues and stuff and jot down his thoughts and stuff on tissue and, and leave it there. And Alex Haley said he, he began to feel like that he was doing that on purpose, so I can see it. But he was reporting everything Malcolm told him back to the FBI. His original intention for sitting down with Malcolm to do the autobiography was to prove how stupid his philosophy was with the Nation of Islam and all that kind of stuff. Because he, he was a black conservative. You know, he, was, he would be aligned with what we would call today the right, the alt-right. He, he was a black alt-right, right? And so, uh, and so his whole thing for wanting to interview Malcolm was to actually embarrass him. And, but their relationship morphed into something else and he changes his life. You know, so, you know, alhamdulillah. Then later on, because of Malcolm, he said, he wrote, he wrote Roots and went into his own history, whatever. Malcolm inspired that. So you come into one thing and then uh, you, leave, you leave doing something else. Alhamdulillah. So... Uh, so yeah, start at the autobiography. There are a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of video and audio lectures and interviews with Malcolm X in it. Study all of those things. There are dozens, if not hundreds of books written about Malcolm. Study all of that. You can't, if, if you ask me what one book that I can read to learn, get a good rounded knowledge about Malcolm X, there is no one book. You have, you know, you need at least a handful of books just to get a basic understanding. I recommend his autobiography. Which one? Alex Haley. Uh, the Judas Factor, The Plot to Kill Malcolm X. The book I just quoted from uh, Malcolm uh, On the Side of My People, A True Religious Life, on a religious life of Malcolm X. Uh, you got a book of speeches by Malcolm X. I can't remember the exact name. It's real small. Uh, as well as all the audio, audio and visual uh, talks. Uh, the, 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 black the Black Book, book yeah, black book by true. Dr. Yusef Naeem Klai. Uh, the Political Philosophy of Malcolm X. Uh, Yusef Naeem Klai, Rahimahullah, he just died a few years ago. He <coughs> was the head of the Canadian branch of the OAAU, the Organization of African American Unity that Malcolm started. And he would ask Malcolm different questions. 
you know, in traveling with him and being in his presence, and he would answer him. And one of the things he asked him, and that's mentioned, and subhanAllah, it's funny you mention that, because I intended to mention that in the talk, but I didn't bring it with me. But I'll just paraphrase what I remember. He said, he asked Malcolm about where, he asked Malcolm where the slaves came from, and he, he basically said uh, that uh, a lot of German anthropologists, you know, they say the majority of slaves came from in the areas that made up the Songhai, the Mali, and the Ghana empires. Uh, they didn't have no nation state. So basically, you're talking about West Africa, right? Uh, and he said, so that's where most of them came from. Now, if you know, all of those empires were Muslim empires that go back to the 10th century. So from that answer also indicates that a larger number of, of our ancestors that came to this country were Muslim. Because even today, in the 21st century, that whole area is over 90% Muslim in every country, right? And that goes back again to the 10th century where Islam came into that area. And then, he's, and then uh, he mentioned some of the things that uh, he, that he was working, to, working towards before he died. And one of the things that he was working towards when he died was to introduce uh, African Islamic scholarship into our curriculum. Yeah, that's one of the things. And it's, made, it's in a black book. And he also talked about uh, getting rid of corrupt uh, uh, leadership that undermines uh, that undermines what we're working for. But again, I'm paraphrasing. But I meant to bring that, those quotes here. But uh, any questions before we close out, Charlotte? <clears throat> I just had uh, one question. Mm -hmm. Was there any talk of or any um, information leading towards the? The government being behind the the stop of funds from various countries, because I know during the time you know, because obviously you know he was being followed and the the U.S. was very interested in what you know he was doing and trying to find ways to stop it, slow it down, or what have you. Right. Being that, say for example, the relationship between Saudi and America mm -hmm. during that time, mm -hmm. is it um, is there anything saying or mentioned or brought up that, you know, possibly the the US say, okay, well now don't don't send him any money, don't you know, try to put a stop on the funding or anything like that. That would be my assumption, but I haven't come across anything explicitly saying that, you know, <clears throat> this government intervened with them sending money. But I would assume that. But I I would also add that even if they didn't, they though those entities wouldn't need any encouragement from not from, uh, to prevent sending him money because of what he was preaching. He was still talking quote unquote politics. And they're always against that, even to this day. Those organizations or the remnants of those organizations, they're not teaching nothing about, they consider that un Islamic. They put that all under Asabiyah. Was he working for the FBI against Malcolm in that time? Yeah. Uh -huh. In other words, most times, especially when you're going against the status quo and somebody put a mic or a camera in front of your face or one of them, they're not trying to help you out. They're trying to undermine you, trying to make you look stupid. And that's what his intent was with Malcolm. Because I think he, before, he had a relationship with Malcolm already because I think he did an interview with Malcolm for Playboy magazine before they start working on an autobiography. Do you have the do you have the name of the book of the the attorneys from uh, Martin Luther King about that book or whatever it's about the the case? Uh, give me a second. <coughs> when the order is given. It's two books. The author's name was William Pepper. That was a lawyer for the King family. Uh, it's two books here. If you Google that name in his books, it should come up.
You see it? William Pepper. Let me see if I can find it real quick. I'll drive it 2%. Uh, Orders to Kill. That's one book. And the other one is An Active State. Orders to Kill. Let me get the full title. Orders to Kill. The Truth Behind the Murder of Martin Luther King. That's one book. And the other book is... The Plot to Kill King. An Active State. The Execution of Martin Luther King. Yeah, okay. So alhamdulillah. So if there's no more questions, inshallah. We'll close out. Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdika na shadu wa naila ayla anta wa staghfiruka wa tubu ilayk wa al asra inna al insan ala fi khusra illa al ladhina a'amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawasaw bil haqqi wa tawasaw bi sabr. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.